So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the director of China Institute, Zhang Weiwei. So, good evening. Uh, as I can recall, this time three years ago, Zakaria, the renowned CNN host, asked tough questions to me at the international conference. He said, Professor Zhang, you always say China should not copy the Western political model. Yet, look at Asia. Virtually all the countries in Asia have adopted Western political system. Why not China? I said, actually, my answer is very simple. Because China has performed better than all the other Asian countries combined over the past three decades, especially on the issues of the greatest concern to the Chinese people, such as fighting poverty, producing middle class, creating overall prosperity, and the list goes on. Indeed, you know, four decades ago, China was as poor as Malawi of Africa in terms of per capita GDP. Now, China is the largest economy in terms of purchasing power parity. China has produced the world's largest middle class. China is now the largest trading nation. Again, the list goes on. So how to explain China's success? You have all kinds of explanations. For instance, cheap labor. But it's not the case. There are many countries which offer cheaper labor than China. Some say FDI, foreign direct investment. Again, many countries have attracted more foreign direct investment than China, especially in per capita terms. Some say the market economy. Again, most countries in the world practice market economy. But so many of them landed in financial disasters rather than financial whatever, economic prosperity. And then, of course, the famous line, you know, China is authoritarian state. Again, by the Western definition, so many countries in the world are authoritarian, but they fail to create what we call miracles. Obviously, China had done something different. If I have to summarize how to explain China's success, two words, the China model, then it will evolve certain complications, especially about the political system, about democracy. How to define democracy? In the West, it's very simple. Multi-party system, one person, one vote, universal suffrage. Yet, Chinese would say, this is at best procedural democracy, not substantial democracy. Then Chinese will say, we have people's democracy, consultative democracy, we have decision-making process, uh, whatever, democratic centralism. The West will say, no, this is not democracy. So we disagree on this very subject. But for the sake of our discussion today, let me borrow the famous phrase from Abraham Lincoln, the greatest American president by many, government of the people, by the people, for the people. Let's, for the moment, use this as a working definition for the sake of discussion. Then we compare you know, item by item for the people, of people, by people. Say, the Chinese side or the Western side or the United States has done better. So let's look at first this for the people. And um, I have found some interesting statistics. The first is, of course, the one I use very often net household assets at median level. If you look at this United States figure, it's declining all the time. And by the year 2010, China's gap with the United States was already very close, $10,000. And this $77,300 at the median level in China's developed region, which has a population of the United States, 300 million, is closer to poverty line. So this enormous change of China's fate, especially vis-a-vis -vis the fate of the United States. And they can look at another figure. To what degree you feel that your country is on the right track? If we look at this uh, study by 
Ipsos, which is one of the largest opinion survey companies. In the case of China, 90% think the country is on the right track. In the case of the United States, 37%. In the case of France, 12%. Then, of course, for the young generation, do you feel that you can live better than your parents? Again, for the Chinese, 82%. Yes. For the Americans, 33%. For France, for the French, I'm sorry, 9%. Yeah. We cannot help it. You know. So, in other words, at least we can see apparently, with regard to for the people, the China model has done better. Now, concerning of the people, if you look at the composition of China's public civil servants, 93% of Chinese civil servants come from ordinary families, ordinary backgrounds. Compared with the United States, let me quote from <laughs> Stiflitz. Huh? United States now of the one percent by one percent for the one percent. Yeah. Actually, it's not far from the truth. Yeah. Now, the most controversial issue is actually by the people. How to rule the country by the people? For the West, the solution is very simple. Uh, as I mentioned just now. One person, one vote, universal suffrage, multi-party system. That became a uh, synonym with rule by the people. Of course, now we know, wherever you go in the West, this problem of what we called, or they called, you know, elect and regret. You look at the approval rating for the US Congress, it's less than 15%. Could you call this a democracy or rule by the people? It's a joke. Yeah. So, if the West focus on procedures, the Chinese focus on more, on substance, or the substance of, substance of democracy, which to my mind is good governance. In other words, we can even extrapolate from this, we should really usher in a paradigm shift from the so-called democracy versus autocracy to good governance versus bad governance. That will be able to explain much better the existing world today and world in the future. Under this kind of guidance, China has conducted gigantic and extensive experiments. For instance, in the political domain, we have tried what I call selection plus election. As I said on many occasions, you know, for top leadership, be a member of this top leadership, usually you're required to work at least twice as the number one of province, which literally means you have governed you know, over 100 million people before you could come to this top leadership level. So this is obviously a better system. Selection plus election is better than simply relying on election. You can re look at this issue of what I call the decision-making process. China practice what you may call new democratic centralism. The example is five-year plan. For every five years, we produce a five-year plan. And in many ways, the success of China is a result of this five-year planning. But this is a great innovation from the Soviet five-year plan. It involves actually hundreds, if not thousands of rounds of discussions, consultations at all levels, from bottom up, from up down. You know, so this is a, an amazing process which leads to better quality of decision making. I remember one friend of mine who is from the United States, and he said uh, Xi Jinping embraces the year 2050, while Donald Trump embraced the year 1950. Yeah. We can plan for next decades, plan for next generation, and this proved to be extremely good for the really fate of China. And behind this, I always argue China's civilizational state, which means that China is a country, a result of hundreds of states amalgamated into one of its long history. And this also means for so many thousands of years, China had been ruled under a kind of one-party system, you may call this, yeah, unified ruling entity. In many ways, the Communist Party of China has continued this tradition and has it further extended and developed. So that explains a lot why the CCP is a unique institution in China. I want to 
really to summarize the China model in brief, in the political domain, as I mentioned just now, it's selection plus election. It's obviously better than simply rely on election. In the economic domain, it's a mixed economy, the state and the market, the state sector and private sector, their roles are on the whole more or less well mixed. This is better than new liberalism, Washington consensus. In the social domain, it is about positive interactions between the state and society which allows Chinese society to be, on the one hand, extremely dynamic, creative, on the other hand, coherent. So this is crucial. Now I will discuss briefly with you China today and China tomorrow. And I think China is now the largest economy in the world in terms of purchasing power parity. If in nominal US dollar terms, I think China will become the largest economy in five to 10 years. China's middle class, from my own estimate, will be twice larger than the US population. The US population is roughly 300 million. 10 years from now, China will have a middle class, perhaps over 600 million people. China has already practiced medical insurance for all and pension for all, although there are levels of differences from region to region. Yet, I think, arguably, China has already done better than the United States. China has also developed the world's largest home ownership system, much larger than all Western countries, which is important. China is also now the leader in the world in the renewable energies, wind energy, solar energy, electric cars, etc. So what will be the implications of all this on global governance, which is our main topic today? I think, first, the China model will inspire more and more countries to explore their own model of development and modernization. Second, the international order will shift, it's already shifting, from a vertical order in which the West is above the rest in terms of power, wealth, and ideas, to a more horizontal order in which the West and the rest are more or less on the par, on equal footing with each other in terms of power, wealth, and ideas. And thirdly, as I mentioned earlier, there will be a shift of paradigm, which means from the so-called democracy versus autocracy to good governance versus bad governance. And in summary, you know, I want to make a point. I said, you know, China has learned so much from the West. China is still learning from the West. China will continue to do so for its own benefit. I think now it's high time for the West to learn a bit more about the China model, the Chinese approach, and the Chinese ideas, or even learn a bit from the China model, Chinese approach, and Chinese ideas. It's not about, you know, we win, you lose, or you win, we lose. It's about how to really enrich our collective human wisdom in tackling all kinds of challenges facing humanity today. It's in the interest of mankind, in the interest of what we call to building a shared future for mankind, for greater peace and for greater prosperity. Thank you. Thank you.